Final Fantasy IV is a game that I can say from its initial release to present day really is one of the greatest RPGs to exist for a multitude of reasons. It also became a catalyst not only for Final Fantasy, but other games in the genre. Its use of dramatic storytelling was unmatched at the time, and it was the first to implement the revolutionary active time battle system, which would be used in later titles. Its characters were also unique and novel. In this video, we'll take a deep dive into the game's story and characters, and I'll provide any critiques along the way. Then, we will examine the game's combat system and side quests, then follow up with an analysis on its music and illusions throughout this epic journey. It's been an experience reliving this game, and it's my pleasure to share this video with you all. There will be heavy spoilers ahead if you've never played, so let's begin. From the onset, the game wastes little time in drawing us into the current events of the world, with Cecil and the Red Wings following orders on behalf of the King of Baron. There's already a sense of internal conflict among Cecil and the Red Wings in the Slaughter of Innocents in Visidia, all for the sake of King of Baron's insecurities of them holding a crystal to which they weren't even intending to use against him. In my opinion, one of the strengths of this game is that it paces the story quite well, and as soon as you arrive at Castle Baron, the story takes an unexpected turn as you're removed from the Red Wings, and the King essentially gaslights Cecil and our friend Intergrood Warrior Kane to go to Mist and to kill the phantom beast that haunts the village. It is also at this point we learn more about Cecil and Kane's background. As Cecil chose the path of the Dark Knights, and Kane, while he could have chosen the same path, chose to honor his deceased father and join the Dragoons. This early interaction helps set the tone and the relationship of these two, which I'll delve into more later. We also meet Sid and Rosa, who both can't believe that she'd been removed from the Red Wings, and Cecil feels dehumanized by the King and wonders if he'll ever regret his actions again should he choose to follow so willingly. Rosa, being Cecil's lover, provides the foundation of their relationship and gives Cecil the encouragement he needs to continue on, even though he's still filled with doubt. Even though it's a minor detail, I like how the game segues into each section of the story seamlessly as you're provided even more context into what just transpired and with how the world itself is enduring a period of uncertainty with monsters abound and the King of Baron it seems to have become a megalomaniac. Yet you endure forth into the unknown with your friend by your side and not knowing why these crystals are so important as they seem so harmless yet so powerful. As we get into the Cave of Mists, we encounter our first ordeal with the Mist Dragon who is protecting the city from outsiders, and rightfully so as we defeat it, we find that the ring that the king had provided Cecil was intended to burn the village to the ground, using Cecil as his pawn for this endeavor. Putting yourself in Cecil's shoes for a minute, you already had reservations about doing the king's deed, and then this just so happens to be the final nail in the coffin, so to speak, for your allegiances with the king and his agenda. We also find out that killing the dragon in the cave as a result caused its summoner to die, and we are none the wiser. The king viewed these summoners as a threat to his hegemony, and used Cecil and Kane basically to do his dirty work. I personally felt pretty gross having killed the young green-haired girl's mother and torched her village. Kane understands Cecil's plight and agrees to help him go against the Kingdom of Baron and ally with the others in the world who share their views. The girl obviously won't come willingly, and much to their surprise, she reveals herself to be a powerful summoner as well and summons a titan to take Cecil and Kane out while closing off entry to the outside of her village. Now separated from our friend Kane, we had to go to Kaipo and recover now. Our rest is as expected short-lived as the general and his soldiers of Baron find us at the inn and Cecil has to protect the girl of whom he knows so little about. After we've taken care of these soldiers, the girl reveals her name, her idea. We also think we find out that Rosa is okay, but she is however incapacitated and bedridden, and so we have to go on a quest to find the Sand Ruby. It's important to note that this section gives the player a nice little bump in difficulty, while also introducing us to this sage Tilla, who is on his way to Damson to rescue his daughter from an evil bard. We also get a little more context into Tilla, as he mentions her idea reminds him of his daughter Anna, and she holds great potential for summoning and spellcasting. Tilla also provides us with a most ominous warning for what may lie ahead not only at Castle Damson, but with the monster that blocks her way ahead. I will level set with you guys, and I was thinking that the Octo Mammoth would personally have been way harder than what it was. It seems with this particular boss anyways, the naivety of my youth when I originally played the game made it seem way harder than the fight itself. Rightfully so, as this is more of a segue to lead you into the next narrative of the story without overwhelming you with an insane boss fight, which those do come later. It also appears that Tella's worst fears came to pass as the Red Wings savagely attack Castle Damson. This whole set piece really drives home the brutality of the Mad King, and his disregard for the people and lives of which he destroys, all for the power of the crystals. As you pass each dying soldier, you feel like you could have done something to stop this if you had just gotten there just a bit sooner. To further add to the damages, Anna, Tella's daughter, has been critically wounded and lay dying. Tella ultimately blames this on the spoony bard Edward, as she ran away from home to be with him, as they are deeply in love. 
We also find out the new commander of the Baron Red Wings, Golbez. All we really know at this point is his strength is unmatched and he was willing to kill anyone in his way to get the crystal. Edward's mother and father even sacrificed himself so he could live. Understandably filled with rage, Tella has vowed to kill Golbez and leaves the party. All this is laid upon the player early and the magnitude of the destruction is not to be understated. Golbez killed an entire kingdom almost single-handedly and at this moment they are but an enigma in the grand scheme of things. Her idea of all people tries to get Edward to snap out of his sorrows but nothing works until Cecil slaps the shit out of him and tells him to pull it together and we are able to get him to join as he relates to Cecil as he loves Rosa as much as he loves Anna and so we depart to the Antlean Cave. This whole section provides an excellent opportunity for the player to do some leveling and obtain any items you might need for the journey, as the cave itself provides us with another cool boss battle, giving you an opportunity to utilize those new skills you wisely grinded for earlier. The Antlion in itself isn't much of a threat to the party either, since you can use Rydea for Blizzard and Thunder spells, while also using Cecil for melee and Edward's turns for healing. No problem, right? Now that we got the Sand Ruby to cure Rosa, we have to backtrack and take the Hovercraft around the map back to Kaito. Strange things keep happening in the world, but what is the cause of it all? We don't know for sure, but something sinister is brewing. Is it Golbez, or can something even more evil be lurking in the shadows? Once we cure Rosa of her ailment, she is able to clue us in someone Golbez, and thinks that he's somehow manipulating the king to gain power of the crystals for himself. There are other crystals in Fabel and Troya, to which we must defend from Golbez and the ever-rising stakes. In a somewhat unsettling scene, Edward is playing the harp by the lake, and is attacked by a Sahajin that, once defeated, his recently deceased fiancé forms as a ghost and convinces him to go forth with his mission and fight for his people and stop Golbez from getting the crystals. Then, we never really see her again after this point. It's unfortunate since Anna really added an extra layer to Edward's character, but later I'll touch more on him in greater detail. With Rosa in tow, we travel to Mount Hobbs where it's blocked by ice and Rydia, who at this moment can't cast fire since she's still traumatized from the fire that destroyed her village and rightfully so. With encouragement from the party, She's able to push this trauma aside and learn to spell fire, and thus begin entry to the mountain in order to get to Fable. You want to know why else I like this section of the game? It introduces Yang, who is one of my favorite monks in the series. After we save him from a mom bomb, the party informs Yang that his kingdom and crystal are in danger, and Yang mentions that Golbez must have been responsible for killing his best men and leaving only the untrained students behind. Once we meet with the King of Fable, who seems to be hesitant of Cecil's involvement, and until Edward, whom he seems to have a prior relationship with, alludes to the danger ahead and convinces him to let Cecil help. This is the first large-scale battle Cecil has had to face, and the forces of Baron come relentlessly as a Red Wings bomb overhead. In a shocking twist, King greets us in the chamber and forces Cecil to fight him without an explanation, and knocks him out effortlessly. With Rosa, Rydia, and everyone back together, it forces an inflection point within Cain, who for but a brief moment questions his actions. That is, however, short-lived as Golbez arrives to question why Cain has hesitated in killing Cecil. During his monologue, he shows just how powerful he is in decimating Yang and Edward. What kind of annoyed me about this part was how much of a bitch Cain acted towards Golbez given he had just reconsidered his actions but a moment ago and listen just kidnap Rosa and as Kane takes the crystal talk shit in his way out. Just really kind of a bitch move overall. That being said, it's still fucking peak cinema right here and firmly establishes Golbez as a monster and a force to be reckoned with. The guy literally beat your ass and took your girl and the party just sit there coping. Really powerful storytelling. After Rydia bails us out with heels, we regroup and confide that we need to get to an airship if we're going to get to Golbez, and Baron is unfortunately the only place that has them. The King of Fable is also a total bro and lends us a boat to get to Baron to borrow an airship. This is also an excellent time to get any items and grind any levels so you aren't overwhelmed for what's ahead. Just when you think you might get a moment of peace on the journey to Baron to steal our airship, we are then ambushed by a Leviathan and lose Rydia. Not only that, but we are also sucked into a massive whirlpool and Cecil loses the whole party as well as being washed ashore. Now alone, Cecil ends up in Mesidia where he meets the town's elder to find the path to the Devil's Road. But first, it's an important thing to note that Cecil must cleanse the darkness within him and turn his sword into light. He must embrace his fate and become a paladin. This is a massive turning point in Cecil's growth as an individual and can begin to embrace the light as he meets Sela atop the Mount of Ordeals, who has a shared goal of defeating Golbez for taking his Anna away from him had ridded the world of his evil. But you didn't think it'd be so easy as to just waltz to the top of the mountain and become a paladin, did you? Right when we see our goal, Scarmiglione, one of Golbez's elemental lords, challenges us as a sort of rite of passage at this point. 
This to me was a nice check for the player, since you should have already been leveled proper before venturing to the Mount of Ordeals. These two phases also foreshadow how a lot of upcoming boss fights are going to function, albeit with different weaknesses and strategies. Plus, I thought it was goofy how he just falls off the cliff after he's defeated. Really adds a little bit of comedy to what is a key turning point in the story for Cecil and the others. To end this, you have to beat your inner darkness as a now transformed paladin to fully embrace your new powers. What better way to do it than to battle your own inner demons? I thought the whole sequence was well done, it really helps build up Cecil as the powerhouse and important figure in the game's world. Cecil also gaining Paladin power as a result causes tell -all to remember all of his too. It's a strange coincidence, especially with the spirit calling Cecil's son. But what does that even mean? Cecil at this point has no recollection of his parents, and it really does make you wonder. Once we return to Mysidia, the elders tell us of a legend of two suns, ascending to the heavens and the moon's eternal light, bringing a bounty to Earth. All of that is a lot to take in, and we still don't really have clarity on what some meant either, but only that Cecil is one of Mysidia legend, given that he conquered the trial of ordeals and became a paladin. Tella also knows Meteor now, and the twins have joined our cause. The only thing left to do now is to steal that airship from Baron so that we can take out that prick Golbez. Things aren't all good in Baron either, as we see Yang, who seems to be brainwashed, turns on us and has us attacked by the castle guards, and we still have to fight him as well. You can't just walk in front of the door either, and we had to go through a waterway where we meet our old acquaintance, Begnan, who, as you might imagine, also betrays us and is allied with Golbez. If I'm to be honest about Begnan, his battle was to this point one of the more annoying ones, and you had to really execute proper strategy like using slow if you had it. Ultimately, just knowing what to focus on and attacking the body first over the arms was the first real test for newer players. But again, this battle serves as another test for the player if they'd been paying attention to the battle tactics and playing smart. The king also isn't the king either, and is another one of Golbez's elemental lords, Kegnazo. This battle is even easier than the last, thankfully, and I just spammed thunder-based attacks and melted his goofy ass. As you might expect, he's not totally dead either, and when Sid is taking us to the hidden airship, the twins selflessly sacrificed themselves to protect Cecil to continue his mission. All at this point, we didn't really know a lot about them, and it still sucks to lose two powerful mages capable of going the distance with us on our journey. Meanwhile, Kane and Golbez scheme to use Cecil to get the last crystal for them, and to use Rosa as collateral. It's a scummy tactic from Kane to use his friend's girlfriend against him, but Cecil knows this is really the only way to get her back since Doan is strong enough to face both Kane and Golbez and come out on top at this point in the story. And so, we venture forth to Troya. I really view this more as a little mini challenge for the player before the story takes a dramatic shift that we've come to expect not only from Final Fantasy games, but JRPGs as a whole. Anyway, with Edward incapacitated in Troya, we have to go to the Magnetic Cave and battle the Dark Elf. The interesting challenge that comes from this is, you guessed it, you can't have any metal weapons, so hopefully you got bow and arrows for Cecil in the party. When you think all is lost and the party is quickly wiped by the Dark Elf, Edward gains the willpower to use his harp to strip the elf of the anti-metal spell on the party and then it's game on. It's a pretty straightforward battle as long as you don't misuse your turns and keep Cecil and Yang healed, even in its dragon form just from watching out from the high damage attacks like Dark Breath, which can be mitigated just from using proper potion uses and using Tella to cast Cura. And so, with the elf defeated, we can finally get the earth crystal we need to save Rosa. Remember when I said the story would take a turn? Well, hold on to your butts, because after Kane takes us to the Tower of Zot, the difficulty cranks up and you had better have been prepared for what lies ahead, as this is one of the cooler sections in the game, both from an aesthetic and a challenge perspective. Some of the memorable boss battles that come from the Tower of Zot are the Maga Sisters who served Barbaricia, Lord of Wind, who, while not particularly difficult as a whole, served as another roadblock and a slightly less annoying boss battle, as we just had to be sure to take care of Sandy, who can cast Full Life, and Sandy also cast Reflect, so you basically just had to rely more on Cecil and Yang as the offensive firepower and use Sid and Tella as your supports. It felt like a battle of attrition at the end, but a huge relief once they're out of the way. Well, here it is. We finally got ourselves to Golbez, who can't seem to resist trolling us about Rosa, who as a result enrages Tella, and much to my surprise, easily best Golbez in a battle. The turning point from this is the meteor spell was so powerful it broke Golbez's spell over Kane, and while he casually brushes Cecil aside with formidable magic, something in him changes, and he doesn't kill Cecil. But why didn't he? We are only left with more questions and answers at this point. Sadly, Tella did not survive this ordeal, but his sacrifice weighed heavily on me personally as a parent, with him giving his life for his child, in the end, was one I feel any parent would make in the face of their child's murder. Cecil and the party vow to fight for Anna and Tella as Kane comes to his senses as they rescue Rosa. 
he was forgiven for his transgressions, and now we have control back of Rosa and Cain, who are both essential members from here on. Oh, you thought you were just going to walk out because Golbez is gone? Not so fast. We now have to fight Barbaricia, who is another one of Golbez's elemental lords. It's not really a hard battle, even though it does seem that way. The takeaway is that you need to use Kane for jump attacks and Yang for physical attacks, paired with Cecil while Rosa heals. Sid felt pretty useless in this one for me. All in all, it was a cool and fun boss. Rushed from our daring escape courtesy of Rosa, we learned that our world not only held light crystals, but there are also dark crystals located in the underworld. Once all the crystals are obtained, a path to the moon opens. Yes, you heard me right, a path to the moon. Fantastic. The underworld is as you might expect, not a welcoming place. As soon as we arrive, we are shot down by the Red Wings and had to help the dwarves in their kingdom. Golbez, however, was wise to us coming to help King Giat, and we are roped into another battle with Calcobrenna. This one really felt like a joke to me, because I leveled myself perhaps too much and utterly decimated this boss. It's worth noting that the boss isn't the focal point of this interaction, and Golbez arrives to monologue about his use for the crystals and to use the Tower of Babel to reach the moon. We then get our first battle with Golbez, but he is much too strong for any of us at this point and slowly wipes the party. Then, something unexpected happens. We are saved by a mist dragon who kills Golbez's dark dragon summon and helps us defeat him in battle. And guess what? It's her idea. And now she's an adult? This is too weird. So then we find out that the Leviathan from earlier in the story took her idea to the Land of Summons, and since time flows differently there, she'd aged quite a bit. Also, Golbez isn't dead enough apparently, and morphs into a hand and yanks the crystal from us. Pretty sure no one saw that coming. With her work now cut out for us, King Gyat tests us to get all seven crystals and scale the Tower of Babel with Golbez, who's at the sealed cavern. Sure, no problem. I also want to note that I love the whole spectacle and significance of the Tower of Babel in this game. In Genesis, the Tower of Babel was built in Babylon with the goal to reach the heavens, but God did not like people becoming prideful, and thus during its construction, mixed people's languages so it could not be finished and serves as an origin of sorts for why people in the world speak different languages. Pretty cool detail from the developers here. Now, regarding the Final Fantasy side of things, this area provides a gauntlet of challenges for the player with a big power creep on enemy encounters, but also rewards you with finding amazing weapons for the later stages coming. The design is also really cool that it's mechanical and futuristic looking in a medieval world, and it makes sense how it can climb to the moon given its look. We also meet Dr. Luguay and Rubicante, who are chatting about how Eblin has been destroyed and has no security forces. We are also treated to another fun, yet simple boss battle with Lugay and Barnabas, but eventually Lugay becomes a monster himself, and you can make pretty short work of him with his final form, using your strongest magic and also physical attacks. We then watch as the cannons get destroyed by Yang as he sacrifices himself to save the party, which this moment really stung for me since Yang was his central party member, and his skills are amazing to use. His death would not be in vain. Even after all this loss, Golbez fails to kill Cecil again, as Sid saves the day, and Ali saves us from the Red Wings, but gives his life to seal the Underworld and the Red Wings from following us to Topside. This is the second party member we've had to mourn, and my heart was hurting just from Yang, and then Sid goes and does this. Even in the afterlife, Sid still takes care of us and his crew and Baron fix up the Enterprise and we can safely go to Evelyn. But what lies ahead there? Surely only death and destruction. Sadly, it seems our thoughts were right as we enter the caves leading to Babel, the path is littered with dead soldiers and mortified families in hiding. But what of the kingdom of Evelyn itself? Before we arrive, a strange man named Edge meets with Rubicante in the path to Babel. Edge is easily pushed aside, Rydia convinces us to help him, and we get one of the cooler party members to use henceforth. While in Babel for the second time, we strangely run into the king and queen of Eblin. This is of course all a trap, and we have to battle against Edge's parents, or perhaps demons pretending to be. This is a powerful moment for me, because after the king and queen break the spell, they reach out to Edge and ask him to lead his people and to take care of them as they fade away into death. This must have been particularly traumatic for Edge, as he never really got to say goodbye and has to think about the last images of his parents being demons. Rubik Kante alludes to it, but Luke was also responsible for this and causes Edge to go Super Saiyan and learn some new skills. The Rubik Kante battle itself was cool, because if you did not plan your turns exactly right, he would punish the absolute shit out of you, and he'd either waste turns healing or reviving. Using summons and hitting his weaknesses to ice eventually paid off, and you're able to lay your parents to rest. Edge, now fully on board, dismisses his men back to the kingdom, as the threat Golbez poses far outweighs that of anything going on at Eblin. Returning to Giat, we are now tasked with getting to the cavern before Golbez can, and guess what? Our old buddy Sid isn't dead after all, he was just having a nap. And so, he helps us once again and gives us a handy drill to get out of the underworld. I'll keep this part brief, since there really isn't a whole lot to the sealed cavern, other than Cecil obtaining the dark crystal and fighting the demon wall, which was a little more than you simply unloading all your big magic attacks and damage attacks until it died. The shitty part though, 
though, is Kane again betrays Cecil and takes the Dark Crystal right to Golbez. I know he was under a spell again, but it's just so disappointing to get screwed over by Kane yet again. Returning to Giat also sheds some light on something long thought to be legend, the Looter Whale. Now with our path ahead, we go back to Mysidia. Our story is coming to a head with the anticipation building. I simply couldn't wait as the story kept getting better and better and the stakes only increasing. I should note that in this particular section, I would also highly recommend knocking out any side quests because soon you'll be entering a path of no return. I will talk about the side quests separately in a bit though. Returning to Mysidia, we remember the prophecy mentioned before about one born of darkness and of light and rising to the heavens. Seems in this moment, it is set to be fulfilled, and Cecil is the chosen one. With an epic cutscene highlighting how majestic the Lunar Whale is, we must head to the moon to find who this voice was that reached out to the Elder. I personally thought being on the moon was an awesome endgame area as well, with the enemies being quite formidable, and the moon itself looking futuristic in a way with its crystal structures. It really helped add to the aesthetic that a more advanced civilization lived here at some point. Another key moment during this expedition was meeting Fusoya and learning of the Lunarians and that they were people who colonized Earth in the moon and provided a place for them to slumber for long periods. Unfortunately, there was one who wished Earth to be destroyed and rebuilt in their image. Zemus is also the one influencing Golbez and seeking the crystals for himself. We also learned that Fusoya had a brother, Kluya, who traveled between the planets and fathered two children, one of them being Cecil, and his spirit was the one atop the Mount of Ordeals. All of this is such a huge revelation at the time, and it's super cool, as you're basically a celestial being with awesome powers, and only you have the power to stop Zemus. Get ready, because things are reaching a climax, and when you return to the Earth, the giant of Babel is laying waste to everything and we must stop it. I really love this part of the game too, since you're really putting everything that you learned to the test with these final battles, and the tactics are essential. Better you have all the spells you need and the best weapons, because fighting all the elemental lords at once is a gauntlet and was a real challenge. Each lord has the same weaknesses as before, so just using your strongest magic and maintain heals was enough for me, but in my case, I was probably a little overleveled since I grinded pretty hard before the endgame. It is so satisfying taking them out once and for all since they're really a thorn in our side for the longest time. But wait, you aren't done just yet as the giant still hasn't been defeated. The giant CPU battle was also significantly easier for me as all you really needed to do was take out the defense node which heals it and tank the attacks from the attack node until you destroy the main CPU and then the attack node falls quickly after. It's then we run into Golbez, who Vesoya seems to already know who he is, and casts a spell that breaks the control Zemus head over Golbez. In this shocking revelation, we come to understand that Golbez is also Cecil's brother. It all makes sense why he hesitated to kill us earlier in the story. Zemus shows Golbez over Cecil since he was holding onto the seeds of evil within himself and helped it grow. Part of me was hoping we could control Golbez within the party, but instead, him and Fusoya travel back to the moon to face Zemus together. With the stakes heavier than ever, we come together as a team united to face the undeniable threat of Zemus on the moon, what I consider to be a fantastic endgame stage within the Final Fantasy franchise. You enter the core of the moon for the final stage, and just the concept itself is really cool, as well as the dungeon providing each member of your party with amazing weapons like Ragnarok for the final battle. In order to get these weapons, it's not so easy as to just open a chest, you actually need to fight many bosses each time you obtain them. A really great example of this would be Dark Bahamut. Again, all these serve as a check to the player, otherwise you wouldn't be worthy of getting Ragnarok now would you? And at long last, we have faced every trial and tribulation imaginable, and arrive to see Fusoy and Golbez confronting Zemus. It sucks that this is the only time we really need Golbez to use his power for good, who has since redeemed himself for all the death and destruction he caused when him and Fusoy beat Zemus, who, yep, you guessed it, doesn't die so easily and becomes a hate-filled entity as he morphs into Zeromus and casually kills both Golbez and Fusoy without much of a battle. Not only that, but Zeromus effectively also kills every member of your team, which if you're a new player at this time, the power of Zemus was simply shocking. It quite literally takes a prayer to bring everyone back to life just to fight Zeromus. That in and of itself is really cool and shows the power and magnitude of this battle. Once you use the crystal, Zeromus shows his true grotesque form and is one of the harder Final Fantasy bosses I can remember, even way back in its original release. Radia felt pretty useless even if you use Flare, so I pretty much just used her as support along with using Rosa for Kiraga, since you really aren't left with a lot of time to think about our actions before Zeromus attacks next. Edge for me was used to throw basically everything I had in my arsenal at him, and Kane I used jump attacks until he also got wiped. It felt like such a clutch and bad ass moment going 1v1 with Cecil against Zeromus, and it took me using all my elixirs, but I outlasted him, and it felt like such a huge moment, and he wanted a fist pump in celebration. Zeromus also has some parting words that he can never die as long as evil lives in the hearts of the living. Bit of a scary thing to think about, and in a sad moment, Golbez chooses to leave the earth behind and return to the moon with Visoya so he could atone for his actions and learn about the Lunarians. Cecil got me a little chokes up too when he finally said goodbye to his brother and forgave him for what he did. This truly shows some excellent growth as a character. The epilogue also 
also provides the player with cutscenes, showcasing how each party member has been doing since the conflict, some of the more poignant ones being Edge and Rydea, while the most important being Cecil and Rosa getting married. That scene was particularly heartfelt because everyone along the journey comes together in celebration of Cecil and Rosa's new union in a perfect way to end the game. Now, I want to take a detailed look at the game's characters that had a profound effect in me, as there are quite a few, and even some that didn't really have much impact on the story. Final Fantasy IV is one of the more diverse casts in the franchise. Each of these characters had to go through their own journey before the battle of their lives against Xeromus. Let's start with the obvious one with Cecil. Cecil Harvey's growth from being a Dark Knight under the King and leader of the Red Wings to understanding his actions were wrong and knowing he had to change led to some of the best growth among the Final Fantasy protagonists in my opinion. From Cecil embracing his Paladin Monk here and shutting the darkness within himself to overcoming all challenges set in front of him so selflessly and helping his team and even forgiving his brother and Kane for what they did speaks volumes on his morality and his character easily a top 5 protagonist in my eyes. Next, as you might guess, I want to talk about my favorite Dragoon in the entire series, Kane Highwind. I love Kane because when we first met him, he starts off as Cecil's trusted ally and good buddy. Over the course of the story, he is manipulated by Golbez into betraying his longtime friend and helping the forces of darkness. He experiences the same ups and downs in his own way that Cecil does, but can be considered on the opposite end here. There is little doubt working with Golbez and hurting his friends affected him a great deal, and during the epilogue of the story, after righting his wrongs and helping destroy Xeromus, he seeks to atone for his sins and go through the Mount of Ordeals for himself and become an even greater Dragoon than his father was. He's such a nuanced character because he very well could have gone down the same path as Cecil, but instead he chose to blaze his own trail and become his own person. Truly an amazing character in my eyes. Rydia is another unique character as well, since when we met her, she'd already suffered a great deal of trauma watching her mother be murdered and her town burned to the ground. Through the help of Rosa, she is able to put her past behind her and learn new magic spells and become a powerful summoner. She even had her own personal journey like Cain in that she was taken to the land of the summons by Leviathan and was able to grow and mature into a strong and resilient adult who helps Cecil until the end and makes peace with who she is. Rosa Farrell is well not a big part of the early game, stuck out to me because, besides just being Cecil's love interest, she went through a lot herself. Think about this. After Mist, she was basically bedridden and could have died if it wasn't for the townsfolk looking after her. Once she had recovered, she is an essential party member both from a combat standpoint as well as being an excellent healer, but also helps her idea learn more about magic and has even been held captive by Kane and Golbez. In the 3D remake, which I didn't do for this video, her mother even questions why she made her learn white magic as it consistently puts her in harm's way. She even refused to let Cecil, Edge, and Kane fight Zemus alone, and her bravery is quite admirable. The closing of her arc with marrying Cecil is pretty cool, as she got a happy ending to her story. Regarding Edge Geraldine, while he didn't show up until closer to the end of the story, his ego and brash behavior made him a fun character, and not only that, he was fun to use in battle. He eventually took over the Kingdom of Evelyn and was still a bit whimsical, but that's part of his charm. I do wish he would have gotten a little bit more screen time, but what he had was certainly memorable. Sid Pol and Dina view as the comedic relief of this game. While he only had some bit parts for the story, I like him helping Cecil get the Enterprise and sacrificing himself in the Underworld, and his interactions with the other characters like Edge helps make the story a bit more lighthearted and makes it feel more grounded for me. You might ask if he's my favorite Sid, and unfortunately I can't say yes, as Sid from Final Fantasy XVI is far and away the best there is to offer. I love that he's also such a badass engineer, and he can just make stuff happen and doesn't really ever whine about it. Sort of that goofy uncle that we all have, and he treats Cecil with respect in a way, like the father that he never knew. With Palome and Parom, I really didn't vibe too much with them. I don't mean to say that I hate them, but the impacts that they had were rather minuscule when compared to the rest of the cast, and their own sacrifices were notable, but it didn't quite hit the same as Yang or Sid when they survived at the end and they were just studying to be better mages. I think it could have been more impactful if given their limited screen time, have them die, but that's really only a small nitpick about these characters. Yang Liden, man, shout out to one of the best monks in the series for me. This guy went from training at the top of Mount Hobbs and getting attacked to joining forces with Cecil and saving his kingdom from an onslaught from Golbez, even though they took the crystal. He even got brainwashed into attacking his friends, and yet he still redeems himself by giving up his life at the Tower of Babel so that they could all escape. If you did the side missions, you can wake him up in the Sylph's Cave and he helps the dwarfs in their siege of the Giant of Babel as well. He eventually takes over as the King of Fable, which is much deserved and a great closure to his arc. Now, we get to talk about my guy Fusoya. While we don't even meet him until we reach the moon, I love that this guy is just chilling in the mood waiting for your arrival, and then he drops some hard truths on Cecil about his and Golbez's past, and it's just a super powerful mage who you only get to use so briefly. Then, him and Golbez just decide to go to sleep at the end of the story. Okay, 
So personally, I'm not a big fan of Edward, but he did serve his purpose well enough in avenging the life of Anna. He was essential in defeating the Dark Elf when he was in no such position to help, and at the end of his arc, he basically goes from being a coward to being a courageous leader of Damson. From a personal standpoint, he did deal with a great amount of personal loss with losing his parents and kingdom to the Red Wing siege and Anna at the same time. He could have simply just given up and rotted away in a depressive state, but he did the right thing and aligned with Cecil and overcame insurmountable odds to achieve his goals and become his best self. He is so much more than just a spoony bard. Golbez also filled the villain role perfectly in this one. Strong, foreboding, menacing, and he continued to play cat and mouse with Cecil throughout the entire story. What I love about Golbez is besides being an ultra-powerful mage, he had the best redemption arc in the game, practically. Gaslighting Cecil and Kane was a nice touch, and even putting the ladder under your spell to do your dirty work is textbook villainy. What really sets Golbez apart from other Final Fantasy villains is that he sees the error in his ways and takes steps to correct them. Like being forgiven by Cecil and the party and joining Fusoi on the moon to learn about his past. If you compare him to, say, Kefka, then he might seem a little bit less nuanced to a degree, but nonetheless, still a top tier Final Fantasy character. Lastly, Tella achieved a lot through the journey from helping Cecil defeat the Octomammoth to avenging the life of his daughter Anna with Golbez's defeat, and he played a role in breaking the spell that bound Cain to Golbez's control. He's also part of the prayer used to revive the party against Zemus, and while it's said he died, his goals in the end were achieved. Now let's take a moment to talk about the game's combat system and side quests experienced throughout this epic journey. Battle Fantasy IV is a particularly unique game in regards to its combat system because this was the first game in the sort of the active time battle system created by Hiroyuki Ito. From Ito's perspective, JRPG battles would at some point be done in real time in the ATB system, allowed this to be done as close to real time as possible given the technology available. Ito felt that too many action elements would alienate users, and the theme he came up with was an action-like game without reflex action elements. Ito felt that implementing that kind of system would give players the illusion that they are doing more so to drive the action than what might actually be happening because of a lot of processes that are automatic. Since Final Fantasy IV, active time battles have become the series staple and evolved into a more complex battle and player-friendly system. Ito felt that this system in Final Fantasy IV was not yet complete. In Final Fantasy IV, the charge time for actions depends on the strength of the spell being cast, but this was a feature that was scrapped for future installments because the developers did not want long waiting times. And so, the goal in the future was to create a balanced system between physical and magical abilities at the player's disposal. Final Fantasy IV also had an easy type version exclusive to Japan. Many spells, abilities, and items were removed or altered, sharp prices were lowered, and other tweaks to make the game easy were put into place. Many enemies' attacks were also renamed. Another piece easy type change is some of the text, which is simplified to make it easier for your other Japanese players to read and to help bring the point of certain comments across more clearly. While that necessarily didn't pertain to combat, I feel it's an important detail about the game to bring up. And all this being said, in my eyes, the ATB system still has never been topped, but Final Fantasy VII Remake's hybrid approach is definitely in contention to topple it, but I want to see it evolve over the course of the trilogy before I place it firmly as number one. From its initial release, to as recently as the Pixar remaster really drove home how great the combat system is even after all these years, and Ito is certainly an innovator in my opinion. Now that we've covered key aspects of the game's combat, let's discuss the side quests. This is actually for being one of the weaker aspects of this game, and it's not necessarily an overly bad thing. From finding Yang in the Self Cave to the Members Only Club, which is also totally optional and, in my opinion, not that exciting, I view these side quests as a way to get more or less all the summons for Raidia and gain essential XP for the endgame. I loved fighting Bahamut and was interested in getting to his arena as well as fighting the Asura and the Leviathan in the Cave of Summons. It is also important to note that in addition to the combat, Four was also the first to introduce these summons as part of the story as well. I think you're doing yourself a disservice if you don't acquire these summons and the battles provide a different challenge. Not to mention getting Excalibur and the Knife for Edge in your side quest journey. The real letdown for me is that there's so few of them in general. If you compare to say, Final Fantasy VI, there is an abundance and it really adds to the longevity of the game. Square really seems to have focused on quality over quantity with 4, and it seems to have worked well enough. Now, let's discuss the music and illusions in this fantastic game. As you might expect, with someone as legendary as Nobuo Uematsu created scores that really set the tone and atmosphere for each area you enter like the Kingdom of Baron that feels both majestic and menacing in a way. This almost goes without saying, but the overall theme is just so good in Final Fantasy IV as well, and it feels so peaceful yet so adventurous. Golbez also has the killer theme, and you could listen to that for hours and really drive home just how evil he was. Of the dungeons, I still feel that the Tower of Babel is my favorite after all these years too. On the softer side, Rosa has a theme that conveys her personality and a compassionate energy to it, 
All in all, Final Fantasy IV has some of my favorite soundtracks in the series, and Uematsu to this day is one of my favorite composers out there. I'd like to now cover some of the illusions within Final Fantasy IV, then close it out with my conclusion and closing comments. Final Fantasy IV contains references to previous games within, as well as religious and mythological influences. I love that the developers made a reference to Final Fantasy II with Kane Highwind, as he carries the same job role and last name as Ricard Highwind. They retroactively changed his father's name to Ricard as a reference to the character. Cecil's Paladin class alludes to the Knight class from Final Fantasy III, as both use low-level white mage magic and can protect weakened party members from attacks. The party dying and being revived against Zero Mist is also a reference to Final Fantasy III. There are more examples of prior game references, but these are some of the cooler ones in my opinion. I mentioned this earlier in the video, but it bears mentioning again. The Tower of Babel alludes to the Tower from the Book of Genesis and makes sense in the context of the story, only that the use of different languages does not apply, but the Tower did reach the heavens, or in this case, the moon. Cain's name and his story hold several parallels to the biblical Cain from Genesis. Both are figures who seek to murder their brother due to jealousy. Her idea of falling into the ocean and coming back as an adult is comparable to the story of Urashima Taru in Japanese folklore. Urashima was a fisher who traveled to the underwater palace of the dragon god Ryujin. He stays here for three days and upon his return to the shore, finds himself 300 years in the future. Urashima himself has also gotten older. The Archfiends are named after four of the twelve named Malbranch in the Eighth Circle of Hell, the Malbolgia from Dante's Divine Comedy. Calcabrina is derived from the Malbranches as well. Again, these are just some of the more poignant examples that stuck out to me. All these aforementioned things are just really cool attention to details from the developers that they put into the game and adds a nice little extra layer of intrigue for me. I have to say, the last time I played this game was way back in my younger days, and as much as it blew my mind then, replaying the Pixel Remaster version still managed to evoke all the feelings of excitement of exploration to the portrayal of Kane during the story still managed to sting to this day. To say this game is classic is almost an understatement. The combat is still so good, and you feel like you can get lost for hours just battling hordes of enemies and it never feels stale. The game's cast is also among the best there is for a JRPG in general. However, I have to say that they are not my favorite Final Fantasy cast of all time, but still easily ranks in my top 5 based on the diversity and arcs provided, and you never stop feeling invested with these characters. This is a great example of good writing from the developers, and I don't think I can say the same about many modern games, which sometimes feels like they focus more on the spectacle and less on the story and character development. This is a game I want to show my son one day for him to enjoy and share the same memories I share so we can talk about how cool Cecil is or just how bad Golbez was. Final Fantasy IV also feels like the game where things really took the next step for Square as they were really becoming less limited by the hardware and took risks to pay off and laid the foundation for future games like 5, 6, and 7 for example. If you're watching this and have yet to try it, please do yourself a favor and pick this game up immediately, as it's basically available on every platform imaginable, from mobile to PC to Nintendo Switch. The Pixel Remaster also provides excellent quality of life changes, like 4 times XP and kill if you don't want to endlessly grind or can't afford weapons. The upgraded graphics and soundtrack are also excellent as well. Some may like the Game Boy Advance versions better, and that's okay, but I prefer the Pixel Remaster for at least. I have yet to try the 3D version, since I'm a bit of a sucker for the classics, but I hope to try it in the future. I hope you've enjoyed the video as much as I've enjoyed making it. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you on the next one. Star Soldier 17, out.